textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. National Center for Science Education teaches, Bossy the cow evolved to blowho the whale. The cow evolved to the whale. And the evidence is the pelvis. Actually, there's a whole lot more evidence than that, as we'll see in a moment. But whales did not evolve from cows. It's unfortunate that if you don't study paleontology and taxonomy, then you're not likely to know much about either one in a way you normally would know something about most other sciences. How do you explain to someone that the ancestor of whales was also ancestral to artiodactyls, being even toed ungulates? You take the most common example of that, something everyone knows, a cow. But that doesn't mean that whales evolved from cows or from anything like cows, because before there were whales was also before there were cows. So now you have to envision a hoofed animal that would be basal to both. And trying to explain something like that to people who think that the world is only 6,000 years old means explaining a deep concept to someone whose perspective has no depth. Before genetic sequencing, some scientists thought that whales were descended from mesonychids, hoofed predators such as no longer exist and are consequently hard to even imagine. From a sufficient distance, some of them might have looked superficially like wolves, so they tried to explain that whales evolved from a wolf-like animal, and then the laity imagined that whales evolved from wolves. Darwin himself thought that whales evolved from something closer to a bear because he didn't know about mesonychids, and genetics hadn't been discovered yet. And now we know that whales are genetically more closely related to hippos than to anything else alive, and that makes it a little easier to envision because the common ancestor of both whales and cows lived before the origin of ruminants, uh, the hoofed grazers with multi-chambered stomachs. So we're looking for an animal that would still have been more inclined to eat meat, and that's easier to imagine when you see it as related to a hippo. But it's not a hippo. The common ancestor of whales and hippos was smaller than either one, and it didn't look like a mix of them either. Although one of the principles of evolution is that the further back in time you look, the more similar related animals begin to appear. For example, if you look at the skull of a pygmy hippo, if you stretch that out, elongate it a bit, you basically got a skull of like a pachycetus. The most important difference between these two is the tail. If we see these as cousins of the same ancestor, that great grandparent had a long tail that it could use for swimming. Whereas the ancestors of hippos and pigs stayed on land a while longer, like the other artiodactyls did, wherein a long tail would slow them down when they need to run, and the tail served them better once it was reduced to a fleece so we're looking for something before that, something like Indohyus, a hoofed animal that was, still had a long tail and that could eat meat, especially fish. So how do you explain to the average person on the street who doesn't know anything about fossil fauna and who thinks that all of the animals we have today had already existed since the beginning, that the ancestor of whales was a hoofed, long-tailed pygmy hippo that lived in the water, swam like a beaver, and fed as an ambush predator like a mammalian version of a crocodile? Whales have a pelvis vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. They have hind limb bones that have no function. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Well, here's the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. I have tried and tried to imagine, and I just can't do it. If all you know are the animals we have now, and you know nothing of the generations that came before them, then it would be hard to imagine a modern whale walking on vestigial leg bones that have now withdrawn deep into its body. But what about the older whales from 40 million years or so ago, whose hind legs were still long enough that they showed outside, as a second pair of flippers? We see them on Dorodon and Basilosaurus, and also on Protocetus, arguably the first actual whale. And that one? still has at least one sacral vertebrae, meaning that the pelvis is still attached to the spine, albeit just barely. Another fact and evidence that there is a relation here comes from embryology, where we see leg buds develop in the fetus of the whale. But the, as the fetus develops, these buds are reabsorbed following their evolutionary pattern, because the only reason they would have leg buds in embryo is if their ancestors had back legs. Then there is the fact that a modern dolphin has been found bearing these as an atavism. That's where a deactivated gene might come back on in a future generation, but only the last stage of it, so the revived trait is still vestigial. These hind flippers were not retained because they're superfluous, unnecessary. They don't serve any purpose. 
they're only there because genetics tend to match the hind limbs with the front limbs. They don't contribute either to propulsion or steering. At best, they might adopt a secondary function, perhaps to grasp during mating, though that would be feeble at best, and the adoption of that secondary function with the loss of the primary function would still render these flippers vestigial by definition. And we'll come back to this and to Dorodon in a moment. At the same time as Protocetus, there were four other important genera. Georgicetus appears to be the closest to the Neocetids, or modern whales, although it apparently propelled itself with frog-like back legs that modern whales don't have. A Georgicetus could use its legs for swimming, but not for walking, as its pelvis and spine were no longer connected. And that's not a very intelligent design, so we shouldn't blame that on an infallible creator, at least not one who refuses to use natural processes. The other three important genera at that time were all in the family of Remingtonocetids. The namesake fossil showed that it too had functional back legs that it could use for swimming. And they were almost certainly fully webbed like crocodile or duck feet, but they weren't quite flippers yet. And they were already vestigial because they weren't load-bearing. And next we look at Cuchicetus, which is more primitive, looking a bit like a crocodile with short limbs that wouldn't have worked very well on land. So it used its tail like a crocodile would, but undulating up and down the way mammals do, not side to side the way reptiles or fish do. I point this out because the preacher's slides imply that he doesn't know that about whales. Delinistes is another Remingtonocetid, but this one was unambiguously intermediate in that it was probably the last of the Archaeocetids that could still crawl out of the water and walk around if it wanted to. And prior to that, Rhodocetus and Myocetus could both walk on land too. And Myocetus, at least, apparently gave birth on land as well. So they haven't yet severed their tether to terrestrial life the way their descendants definitely did. Ambulocetus was named the walking whale because it was the first unambiguous Archaeocetid, but it obviously wasn't the only one that could walk. And prior to that, we have Pachycetus, a smaller version of a primarily terrestrial animal. The length of its legs imply that it could run, but the long tail and, and the, the long toes, as well as that crocodilish head with the eyes and nostrils perched on top and those shark-like triangular teeth, show that it was a clearly capable swimming predator, a perfect example of a transitional species. Another of its adaptations is that their bones were unusually dense. That means that where other animals would naturally float, these were able to stay submerged as long as they wanted, even while swimming. And the apparent predecessor to Pachycetus, Indohias, had the same adaptation. And another thing that these both had, that all of these had, is a structure in the inner ear that is unique to whales. The shape of the auditory bulla is so distinct as to be diagnostic. So that even if the rest of this looks like a long-tailed crocodile deer, you know that that's a whale. So there we have a complete sequence from land to sea, explaining why the hind legs disappeared, all except for those tiny bones that aren't even connected to the spine anymore. Almost every type of whale has these bones there, right there in the abdomen. They are not attached to the spine. That's correct. Textbook says the whale's pelvis is located far from the vertebra and has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. This is a lie. Those little bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to that allow the whales to reproduce. Whales are kind of big, you know. And without those special muscles and those special bones, they can't get more baby whales. <laughs> what the preacher is oh so delicately dancing around is that because whales are mammals, they have to procreate the same way all mammals do. But without firm ground or legs to stand on, then as their legs were diminished, their penises were profoundly enhanced, having to wrap around the female if necessary to find its way where it needs to go. Imagine the penis having to compensate for something else being too small. As both of these organs, the legs and the penis, are based on the pelvis, then the pelvis could not disappear completely because a powerful, potentially prehensile python of a penis has to use that as its only available anchor point. If whales were intelligently designed special creations, then the divine designer could have given them a more efficient system that was better suited to their physical conditions. He could have also given them gills, which would have been better for them too. But being evolving organisms, they had to modify what they had in order to adapt. So either these guys are ignorant about their whale anatomy or they're lying to your kids trying to spread their theory. <laughs>
Science is not a religious belief and does not seek converts, so there is no need or desire to lie to students the way apologists must. And scientists couldn't get away with that the way apologists do. Instead, hypotheses are published to peer review, to be tested by critics who don't want to believe in them. But if they can't find anything wrong with it and it is supported by all the available evidence, then it has survived peer review, at least for the moment. If a hypothesis survives a sustained, substantial, critical analysis over a prolonged period and comes out better supported for it, uh, showing profound predictive and explanative power, then it graduates to the level of theory. But it's not true that those are vestigial, okay? Yes, they definitely are vestigial by definition, meeting all of the required criteria, being reduced so much that they're incapable of performing their original function. For example, a bird's wings are for flying. I think everybody accepts that. And even creationists will admit that when the wing is too small and inflexible to fly, that it can still be adapted for swimming. That's not the original function. So penguins are using the vestige of their airborne ancestors to dive into the sea and fly underwater. I think even creationists accept that. And the same goes for turtles, uh, webbing their toes and turning their feet into flippers. Even creationists accept that sea turtles are not a separate creation from land turtles or from tortoises, that they accept that level of evolution. The same applies to mosasaurs, the largest lizards that ever existed, turning their feet into flippers and their tails into flukes, just like ichthyosaurs did also. Creationists can accept all these things, but for some reason they refuse to accept the evolution of whales. Even though we have this complete, consistent, fluid procession of flowering forms in that sequence, with every transitional intermediate necessary, believers have to find some way to pretend that none of that is real. There are no vestigial organs, and if there were, think about it, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. There are many vestigial features in numerous animal families, as we've already seen in the previous episode, and we'll see a few more examples in upcoming episodes. But evolution is not defined as necessarily gaining anything all the time. It's a theory of biodiversity, where in one group becomes two different variants, each dividing into two or more increasingly distinct subsets, and so on it goes, indefinitely. Some of them will gain features or lose others, and both count as evolution. How's that going to help? You lose everything until you have it all? The preacher already knows how evolution teaches that we lost our tails and our gills and all but the last of our claws and our fur, but he doesn't want you to think about that because he doesn't want you to understand how evolution really is. He's even admitted that he doesn't want to understand it himself because he wants to believe and because he wants you to believe something else. The problem is that we have all of this evidence for the evolution of whales like we have for the evolution of everything else, and the preacher wants to pretend that none of it exists or that it's all somehow coincidental which would make his God a very deceptive one for creating everything in such a way that, that we have all these different lines of evidence implying evolution. Yet, the preacher's only counter-evidence is a compilation of man-made myths and legends which say that God created sea monsters. And it's a book written by people who thought that whales were fish. We could spend two days on whale evolution. Every one of them, Ambulocetus and Pachycetus, have all been proven baloney. They can't be intermediate species, okay? Remember that an unsupported assertion has no more credence than a claim that has already been proven wrong. And here the preacher is, once again, declaring things to be true because he wants them to be. But neither Ambulocetus nor Pachycetus nor any of these others were ever disproved. They were never shown to be baloney. If they had been, then there would be documentation somewhere as to how that happened. But all the preacher can show is fine print that he doesn't give you time to read because it's not the citation that it should be. Instead, it's just his own notes showing how he doesn't understand any of this and is just trying to reject it all without consideration or comprehension. The authors were certain the feet were enormous even though nothing was found. Here the preacher is quoting from an old science magazine, and he references a different individual than the one I'm showing. It would have been fair to guess that since Ambulocetus is a bigger, more derived version of Pachycetus, that its feet would be similar. This other skeleton is much less complete than that original Ambulocetus, but it does include the toes, and as you can see, the scientists guessed correctly, despite the preacher's many insinuations. Basilosaurus could not possibly have been ancestral to any of the modern whales. That is correct. 
Evolution is not a ladder, it's more of a branching tree, or the analogy I like is a tumbleweed. Now, taxonomically, starting with something like Duradon, one branch led to Bacillosaurus and the other led to the Neocetids, which then eventually branched into two different families, starting with toothed whales and then eventually baleen whales. There are many fossil forms of each, so the story of whale evolution doesn't end here. And the most important thing to add is that Neocetids developed blubber, which the serpentine Bacillosaurus did not. Uh, consequently, when the currents changed and the water got cold, Neocetids persisted where Bacillosaurus could not. Pacocetus was made from one small piece of jaw, a, few, a, small piece, a small piece of skull, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. You find a little bit of jaw, a little bit of skull, a couple of teeth, and you know that it's half whale, half something on land? That's kind of a stretch, don't you think? Initially, with the first Pacocetus ever discovered, that was true. But notice how the preacher says this while looking at a subsequent discovery. A Pacocetus fossil consisting of most of the skull, most of the front leg, back leg, pelvis, and nearly the entire spine, and a few ribs as well. And he knows that because he put his own notes there, saying that Pacocetus was wolf-like. No, it wasn't. It was a predatory mammal, and that's as close to wolf as it gets. The teeth indicate that it only ate fish, and it had hooves as indicated by a distinctive structure in its ankle, linking it to artiodactyls like cattle and deer. So what kind of wolf is that? It's more like a sheep in wolf's clothing, only in this case, it's more like a sheep-wolf hybrid in snorkeling gear. <laughs>